just too good to be true. I can take my eyes off of you. It would be like heaven to touch. I only hope you so much. At long last, love has arrived. And I thank God I'm alive. You're just too good to be true. Can take my eyes off of you. Pardon the way that I stare. There's nothing else to compare. The sight of you leaves me weak. There are no words left to speak. But if you feel like I feel, please let me know that it's real. You're just too good to be true. Can take my eyes off of you. I love you, babe. And if it's quite alright, I need you, baby. To warm a lonely night, I love you, baby. Trust in me when I say, Oh, pretty baby, don't bring me down. I pray, Oh, pretty baby, now that I found you, stay and let me love you, baby. Let me love you. You're just too good to be true. I can't take my eyes off of you. You'd be like, Heaven to touch, I wanna hold you so much. At long last, love has arrived, and I thank God I'm alive. You're just too good to be true. Can take my eyes off of you. Right, alright, I need you, baby. To warm a lonely night, I love you, baby. Trust in me when I say, Oh, pretty baby, don't bring me down. I pray, oh, pretty baby. Now that I found you, stay, oh, pretty baby. Trust in me when I say.
You're just too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off of you. You be like heaven to touch. I want to hold you so much. As long as love has arrived. And I thank God I'm alive. You're just too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off of you. Pardon the way that I stare. There's nothing else to compare. The sight of you leaves me weak. There's no words to speak. But if you feel how I feel, please let me know how it's real. You're just too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off of you. I want to, I want to. Everybody. Welcome to the Late Night Coffee Show. Let me just uh, do the uh, sound checking here. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, if so, uh, let me know. Okay, we have a lot of uh, uh, people joining tonight. Okay, let me just double check it here. Yeah, it's working. Okay, I'm just monitoring through my own. <laughs> Facebook here just to make sure that everything's okay. All right, exciting. So uh, welcome to a late night coffee show. Tonight is uh, episode 16 and we have people just joining like crazy right now. We have Lisa joining from Maple Ridge. We got Albert, Albert Louis joining from Calgary. We got Robert joining uh, from Salmonars. Paul Lee from Chilliwack. Okay, absolutely, Paul. Good to see ya. Good to see everybody. Obviously, we have uh, one real special guest joining us from um, Toronto, so that's gonna be awesome as well. Okay. Um, so you know he's on standby as well, and uh, yeah, we're gonna start the tonight's uh, coffee show. Um, what did I do today? What did I do? Okay, let me go on. Uh, all right, okay, so had a busy, busy, busy week, like many of you, okay. Who else is coming through here? Ooh, Montreal, who's coming from Montreal? All right, okay, all right, awesome. Hello from Montreal, who's from Montreal, guys? Okay, Montreal, Alain, oh, you're from Montreal? I never knew that, okay. Fantastic, you guys are like uh, three hours ahead of us, right? Three or four hours. Uh, Patrick and Lisa from uh, Chicago as well. Thank you for joining, Lisa. Fantastic. We also have uh, uh, Dr. Kim joining from Philadelphia as well. YK Kim, I would love to have you, Dr. Kim, as a guest uh, for the Late Night Coffee Show live as well. We have so much to learn from you as well. So, all right. Tonight's topic is soft tissue is the issue. Uh, special guest, of course, is Dr. Jeff Lee joining us uh, live uh, soon from uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. One of the premier renowned periodontists uh, in this country. Uh, the thing about Canada is uh, it's a big country. It's a big land, right? One of the largest countries in the world. But the population density is so low. So, you know, uh, we don't get to see each other often, but we know who's who in this country. So that's one thing great about it. Okay. Um, what did I do this week? Okay, this week, uh, today was busy day, right? Today, uh, I went to get my first shot vaccination about time, right? About time. Uh, it was one of those drive through vaccination clinic. I don't know uh, how many of you got your vaccination done yet, right? Okay, you can raise your hands up and shout out. Uh, took me long line up in the car, like 20 minutes, right? But actual vaccination process was very, very quick. They literally get me to roll down my window and get permission to poke them on the arm. I got the Pfizer one, right? Uh, it was like a small little prick, right? Okay, and then was done, right? It was done. Um, just a little sore on the left shoulder, like I had a workout or something. That's about it. 
I feel fine. And uh, I made this remark, drive through vaccinated, drive through vaccine easy as Big Mac. So uh, I you know, went to a drive through McDonald's and celebrate myself, uh, treat myself to a Big Mac meal, right? With the fries and Coca-Cola, right? So that was great. That was great, had a good time. However, the guy who uh, was uh, uh, screening me, not the person who was injecting, but screening me, looks at my shirt because I was wearing this uh, 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 t-shirt okay, of one of my favorite band uh, growing up, uh, Rush. And he looks like, I was like, oh, who are those guys? You know, are they any good, right? Uh, so I said, you don't know Rush, right? He goes, oh, no, man, like, you know, are they good? I said, okay, whatever. Do you guys know who Rush is, right? Rush. Rush is a rock band, one of the greatest Canadian rock band ever, right? If you haven't, like, you know, actually listened to them, like, they're just amazing, okay? Check out on the YouTube, right? The three rock, uh, three, uh, uh, three member band, you'll be surprised at what level the creativity and the excellence, elite skilled drummer, skilled bass guitar, uh, skill uh, uh, acoustic and uh, and the singing styles amazing probably the greatest band ever and and it's from Canada right so that's something for you guys to check out right also my mom while I was away uh, getting vaccinated my mom came by because I don't get to really see her that often because of the social distancing and you know, like elderly people they don't want to get out of their home right they're like a prisoner of their own home but you know she uh, uh, New, you know, my birthday coming up. Actually, a lot of people guys were wishing me happy birthday, but my birthday is not till 26. Okay, I'll be turning 51. Okay, 51 years old. And the funny thing is, I started this fundraising. Um, you know, uh, last week uh, because Facebook recommended to do a fundraising for my birthday. And sure, sure. I started. I've never done a fundraising ever online before. Right. And then um, our goal was, as you can see, was $1,000. But within one day, right, you guys uh, pitched in and then we reached the $1,830. I was so, so humbled. A uh, lot of um, uh, people who joined in to uh, pitch in for my donation project, which is for autism. I don't know if you guys know, uh, but I have a special heart in my heart for autistic children because my older son is autistic. Uh, he was diagnosed with autism when he was three years old. Before then, I had no idea anything about autism. It was eye-opening. It was one of the hardest things for me and my wife to accept and to go through, right? Now my son is 20 years old. He's attending Emily Carr, our school. He wants to be a children's book uh, illustrative uh, artist, right? So, you know, life goes on. But anyway, so ever since um, my son was diagnosed with aut uh, autism, I've been fundraising uh, for uh, Autism Society in Canada. But this was the first time sponsoring, um, uh, doing, doing a fundraising on, a, on a Facebook. And uh, I just want to uh, thank all of you guys for uh, pitching in. Uh, it's not the uh, amount of the dollars. My whole uh, objective was to you know, raise awareness of uh, these, uh, you know, the spectrum disorder that we don't know much about um, you know Bernard's son also uh, um, is autistic as well that's why me and Dr. Bernard Jin we are very close because we have something that we share um, you know I share his uh, uh, difficult times and he also understand mine as well so um, and and my mom also uh, came to drop of uh, my favorite dish right kimbap and um, uh, japchae and uh, dokdobuchim Right. So if you, you, if you are Korean, so you know uh, these are traditional dishes, and I love it. And uh, then the reality is, you know, I don't really need anything for my birthday. Right? I have everything I've ever wanted. I have a beautiful wife. Uh, I have three beautiful children, uh, and I have a you know greatest job in the world. Uh, so like many of you, I already have what I have. All I need is to appreciate what I've already got. Right. So uh, thank you. So you know, no further ado. Okay, I'm just gonna check before. Uh, we have from, uh, yes, okay, today's Tom Sawyer, <laughs> Modern Day Warrior, I mean, straight to this Tom Sawyer. Th that was the, the song they were singing, The Rush, that little video clip I was showing, Tom Sawyer. It's a great, great band. Um, Prince George, Ryan, thanks for joining again. Okay, 
Yeah, Neil, do they perform often regarded as one of, if not the best drummer ever? I think he's right up there. Uh, as a drummer, uh, same level probably as the drummer of the Led Zeppelin. Okay, uh, so yeah, man, right on the rush. Okay, the pride of Canada. So let's get back to today's um, special event. The title is Soft Tissue is the Issue. Okay, um, and of course, the special guest is Dr. Jeff Lee. Okay. Uh, the reason, uh, um, you know, few, few reasons why I wanted to talk about soft tissue. Okay, few reasons. Obviously, we have, uh, we're promoting Dr. Jeff Lee for his uh, soft tissue course. I think he runs one of the best soft tissue course out there. Not only, you know, you need to be a great clinician to teach soft tissue, but when a lot of our doctors, resident doctors are, you know, general dentists, uh, to teach general dentists how to soft tissue, um, you know, we need somebody like Jeff who really focuses a lot in fundamentals, okay? Because it's a fundamental that wins the game. Uh, yeah, you know, Dr. Jeff can be a very, very fancy uh, surgeon. You've seen his uh, Mercedes-Benz uh, suturing style. He's, he's impeccable, but I think his strength really is a fundamental. So, so I asked him to uh, come to my late night coffee show and uh, give us a tips on, uh, you know, soft tissue, uh, what his philosophy is, and also asked him to uh, you know, go over some case reviews, okay, to take you through what his uh, routine procedure is like, and how we hope that we can also benefit from his teaching as well. So mark your down, June the 4th and 5th, uh, he goes up to the pig jaw course, FGG and CTG. It's already almost uh, more than half full, guys. Okay, already more than half full. So uh, I know this course is gonna sell out. So who, those who are looking for hands-on, okay, you know, do sign up. So Dr. Jeff Lee, so I don't know if he's in standby right now. I think he is. Yes, I see him, okay. I see him on the uh, other screen, so he is in standby. So Gene, joining us from Calgary, all right. Awesome, Gene, good to, good to have you as well, all right. Okay, so I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over the scene to have Dr. Jeff Lee. Okay, let me uh, switch my camera right here. Okay, all right. It's almost like uh, I'm right with them, right? I can almost uh, give him a kiss. <laughs> 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 I tried that with June and he almost uh, freaked out. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I have to do that with every guest, okay? So, you guys, let's welcome Dr. Jeff Lee, okay? Let's welcome him, okay? Hi, Dr. Uh, Kwan. Uh, hey, Thank Jeff. you. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> I, know I haven't seen you for a while, but you know what? Thanks to technology, it's good to see you. And so, what, three hours ahead there, right, in Toronto? Yes. Okay. Yes, just past 10 o'clock. I know that's your sleeping time. I know you like to go to bed early, but thanks, <laughs> a, lot. thanks a lot, my friend. Okay. All right. We'll have a lot of people joining up for you. Okay. A lot of people joining up for you. So, Jeff, uh, you know, take this moment to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, those who are, you know, hardcore fan of Dr. Jeff Lee, you know, you know don't need no introduction, right? But we also have a lot of doctors from all over uh, North America, and we have some doctors uh, in our uh, begin face group who are you know, pretty much, uh, you know, members from global. So tell us a lot about, little bit about yourself, Jeff. All right. Uh, well, um, my name is Jeff Lee. I'm a periodontist here practicing in Toronto and the greater Toronto area. Um, I grew up in Toronto since the age of nine. Before that, I was born in China, but also lived in Sweden for a few years. So I've been pretty lucky to have lived uh, in many different areas of the world. Um, I went to college here at the University of Western Ontario, but then I went on to do my training for dentistry in the US. So dental school was done at the University of Pennsylvania down in Philadelphia. And then I went on uh, directly after dental school to do a periodontal residency at the University of Michigan mm. uh, in Ann Arbor. So after that, I uh, had the privilege to work at a pretty large group um, practice, group perio practice in Boston. And uh, I did that for two years before, you know, I decided it was time to come home, come back to Toronto and set up something here. So I've been here since uh, for about three and a half years now, almost four years. Um, and this is where I practice. Um, you know, as Dr. Kwan kind of already mentioned, uh, I basically only do periodontal work um, between soft tissue and implants. Those are, I would say, probably the two main things I, I do now. 
Um, and uh, as you mentioned about my course, yes, go blue. I don't know who wrote that, but go blue. Um, um, Shane, that was especially because they're playing. <laughs> Shane, yeah, playing tomorrow, and uh, this is a uh, this is an interesting uh, March Madness tournament. I'm a really big basketball fan. Uh, there's been a lot of upsets already, so <laughs> who knows what's gonna happen this year? Absolutely, I remember uh, first time seeing Jeff. I think it was in Toronto. I was visiting Ray. And, uh, you know, I was uh, about to expand. I was during the midst of uh, expanding uh, my Bison Studio into the uh, eastern part of the country. And I wanted somebody um, uh, who can uh, be one of the key uh, 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 speaker for Bison Studio in Toronto. And Dr. Ray Han introduced you. And then I was like, just, you know, when I first looked at you, like, my goodness, I look like a high school kid. But, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, it's so smart, right? So smart. And, uh, um, you know, never cease to amaze me. Never cease to amaze me. Um, you know, because, like, I'm an implantologist, right? And I do soft tissue work, too. But, you know, I soft tissue, appreciating soft tissue didn't really come early in my career like 25 years ago when i started to do the implant nobody really talked about the importance of soft tissue it was in fact it was the opposite people saying that implant is not teeth therefore we don't really need to pay attention to so much of a soft tissue uh and there was really not that much soft tissue uh, courses going around right of course you know fast forward five years later ten years later i look at my own cases and and, and to be honest a lot of my um, understanding and my uh, uh, evolution of my uh, journey as implant dentistry uh, has been from my failures. Okay, a lot of my cases I start to notice is like mandibular posterior molar area start to have a bone remodeling and bone losses, mm -hmm. especially in the second molars, right? Even though I put the exact same implant, same depth in yep. the, uh, you know, the first and second molar, I notice more problem with second molar area and come to realize that we often find less attached gingiva and less vestibular depth in those areas. So, so I started to probe a little bit and rebuild a little bit, but now of course, you know, it is absolutely important. We, everybody understand that how important having a good uh, soft tissue of biotype and bioform around the implant as well as, you know, natural dentition as well, right? Okay, so, mm -hmm. you know, I really appreciate, uh, you know, your time. Um, obviously, I mean, this is not going to be a full-on course because we're only going to have uh, you know less than an hour to you know talk about you know your philosophy and a little bit of overview of uh, you know what you think about soft tissue. And all along the way, I think you have a few cases that you're going to go over with, and you know that'll that'll give us a little bit of glimpse of uh, you know what your course is about and what the general dentist, as a mm -hmm. general dentist, what we should focus on, right? Okay, so I really appreciate mm -hmm. that. Absolutely. Okay, we also have a Luis just joined from Tampa Bay. I told you, Jeff. Okay, you're a fan, man. These people, they never went by Raptors. myself. I know, right? These people <laughs> joined because of you, right? If it was me, <laughs> these people will never join, right? Okay, so I'm just going to change the scene, okay? So uh, tell us about some of these cases that you've uh, prepared for us, Jeff. Yeah, um, before I get into the cases, I just wanted to comment about what you said about just the evolution of, uh, I guess, knowledge and also um, understanding of soft tissue. And I really think it has changed a lot, right? Even, especially for implant dentistry, I think, uh, when implants were first introduced, they were introduced as, you know, the, the phenomenon of titanium being able to osteointegrate into bone. Uh, all the studies at that point were, were kind of focused on bone integration, uh, volume of bone, and then eventually when, when implants got, you know, a bit more mature, I think people looked a lot into bone grafting procedures, right? There was so many types of procedures to do and also materials to use. And I think the focus again was was strictly on bone and how much do we need around implants for long-term survival. Mm -hmm. And I think now, like if you, if you go to an implant course now, if they don't talk about soft tissue, they're missing a huge chunk of that education, I think. Oh, absolutely. Um, even even concepts that are coming out, like the zero bone loss concept is not based about bone. Mm -hmm. It's based on soft tissue, right? it's based on biologic width. So I think it's really neat to see kind of that evolution and, uh, and the direction that things are going. And I think a common question I ask a lot of students in a course is, if you had the choice around an implant of thin bone and thick tissue, 
or mm. thick bone and thin tissue, which one would you choose if you had to choose one? Oh, I read um, obviously, you tissue. would want both. Thick tissue. Yeah, exactly. And I think thick that tissue, changed. Man. That has changed a lot. For sure. For sure. Um, yeah. So um, I think what the situation. I think is, that's a lot of time people judge on what they can see on the X-ray. They don't. You don't see stuff on the mm -hmm. X-ray. The soft tissue is hard to judge. Mm -hmm. But I tell you, mm -hmm. you know, we know what we don't see can can hurt you, and that's a soft tissue, right? I totally understand with you. Yeah. So uh, case one, uh, this is what do you? This is your uh, uh, FGG from the lower anterior, right? Okay. So yeah. uh, tell us a little bit so about. So I picked your, a few. Yeah. yeah, I picked a few cases, which um, you know, for the people that are kind of on the fence about the course. Um, if you're interested in it but haven't signed up, uh, I picked four cases that are different from each other and also a pretty good representation of what I will show at the course and what I think anyone should be able to achieve predictably. You know, as Dr. Kwan mentioned uh, earlier, I do focus a lot on the fundamentals. Um, so there will be a good chunk of the course dedicated to just suturing. You know, we're probably going to spend, you know, two hours uh, working on suturing because mm -hmm. all of this is pretty dependent on that. So. Um, this case is a pretty straightforward um, free gingival graft case. Uh, in the lower anterior for, uh, for the laterals and the centrals is probably where you're going to do the most of these free gingival cases. Um, in this patient, as you can see, she's had some free gingival grafting previously by somebody else uh, from the canines back. So now you can see there's a pretty prominent frenum, there's some mild recession, and you can probably appreciate, even just from a photo, how thin mm. uh, the tissue looks. Mm. So if we look at the next slide, you can see uh, the overhead view or the uh, clusal view, and you can mm. see that thin tissue relative to the canines, and you can also see the frenum, how prominent that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and then you see a bit of mild crowding for her, but mm. um, to me, this is a very, very common, very straightforward case. Uh, do you do you consider so the this next a straight, uh, straightforward slide case? will just show would you really consider this a straightforward because I mean you know for a lot of a, <laughs> a, a general dentist when they first see it right lower anterior with the Freeman and everything that would automatically think that this is wow this is gonna be a really tough case and they will refer out right but you know if you understand the yeah. fundamental you're saying is that this can be done uh, with a fundamental understanding to do it predictably right yeah I think this First of all, this location is is the most common to require a free gingival graft, especially for people who have crowding naturally or who have had ortho treatment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I say it's it's um, straightforward because the don't let the frenum scare you. The frenum is just part of the anatomy there. And if you do the free gingival graft the way I will teach it, it's going to take care of the frenum by itself. So you don't have to do like a separate phrenectomy for cases like this. Mm -hmm. So here you can see, um, I know I've skipped a step where we do the dissection, but you want to do a nice, even uh, partial thickness dissection for the area that you're going to be grafting. Uh, once you're done, you want to make sure uh, you take an accurate measurement of the graft and procure that from the palate. Of course, in the course, we will talk about how to harvest, you know, where to harvest from, the thickness that you want, and, and all those details. Mm -hmm. um, here you can see suturing with uh, six zero proline, which mm -hmm. I think is either is probably the best suture to use for soft tissue. It's mm -hmm. pretty agreed upon by most periodontists, I would mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. um, some people like to use other things like Vicro mm -hmm. or, or sometimes Chromic Gut because mm -hmm. it dissolves. Mm -hmm. I find proline to be best just because it's super tissue friendly. Uh, you can leave these on for a long time and they won't collect much plaque. Mm, mm, so suturing wise, in terms of techniques, again, we'll be covering this at the course. You'll see lots of simple interrupted sutures kind of around the graft. Mm. And then over the 3-1 and the 4-2, mm. um, you can see kind of a suspensory or compression suture, I like to call it, which is mm. wrapped around the tooth and engaged into the periosteum. So that's how the patient leaves, and that's the occlusal view. You can kind of see those suspensory sutures pretty well here, that they're almost kind of uh, hugging the roots to kind of uh, press the graft onto the root surfaces, which you want that intimate kind of connection so that there's no dead space and you get nice, even healing. Wonderful. I mean, that looks uh, really, really good. I mean, how, how, I mean, that's one thing about the suturing, um, you know, 
a lot of people overlook at the importance of suturing, right? Um, mm -hmm. They do just implant dentistry and, you know, they didn't incorporate the, like for my example, like when I started learning implant dentistry, that was the easy part. But when I start to incorporate the soft tissue, that's when I start to use, mm -hmm. uh, you know, smaller the needle drivers, smaller sutures. Yeah. So you know, I wish I got into soft tissue earlier, uh, but when I got the soft tissue later on, it was like a learning how to do surgery all over again with the Castro and you know <laughs> needle holder and things like that. It was like miserable at the beginning, and you know I didn't really know about the surgeon's knot. It's something that fundamental. Even though I was doing surgery right. for you know so long in my early career, you know when I started getting soft tissue, the importance of again fundamentals, right? Yes, wow, absolutely. look at this, look at this. So this is healing, uh, I think only after three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see, uh, again, uh, one thing I want to point out is that we did not get any root coverage on this case. And that was not part of the goal to get root coverage. Um, as you saw where I sutured the graft, mm -hmm. it was de deliberately sutured uh, below the recession. Mm -hmm. um, this patient's recession is caused by you know the teeth being a little bit out of position being crowded um, maybe a little bit of history of periodontal disease mm -hmm. so i would say to get them to be completely covered is possible you could do maybe another graft after this is healed but without the proper tissue thickness mm -hmm. um, it would not have been possible the first time around so the goal here was just to really thicken the, mm -hmm. the biotype i have a question then jeff uh, when would you, you know, recommend to do a CTG versus FGG? Uh, I know the answer. Mm -hmm. I'm asking not because I don't know, but I'm, I'm asking behalf of uh, these these doctors yeah. here, right? Uh, I mean, I would have done FGG too, right? Uh, like you have, but some of the, the our, our our you know members will wonder like, why not CTG? Because from a referring dentist perspective, mm -hmm. sometimes you know we get referred for these type of procedures. And Bernard does quite a bit in our office. Uh, some of the times the doctors will ask for mm -hmm. CTG, but Jeff, but Bernard will say, you know what? No, 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 no. The patient is a FGG, right? How do you tell? Mm -hmm. Could you go over that a little bit? So I think that, I mean, there's a lot of factors to consider when you're treatment planning, right? So we can, we can come up with many treatment plans, but the diagnosis, there should only be one proper diagnosis. Um, the way I look at soft tissue cases is one, what is the patient looking for, mm. right? Is the patient looking for a cosmetic, uh, root care, maybe the activity that they want to address. Um, two, I want to look at the location. So I would never do an FGG, you know, on the maxillary arch on the, uh, on the top, because uh, a lot of times they do can they can heal with a patchy look, mm -hmm. so that's not aesthetically acceptable, I think. Um, and finally, what's really important is diagnosis. Are these you know we're gonna go over this in the course, but uh, there's an old classification by Miller that mm -hmm. tells us what is the predictability for root coverage. So in some cases like this one, where I think the predictability is not that great. Mm -hmm then what's more important here is to thicken the tissue. Uh, and basically what we're trying to do here is to prevent any future recession in this area. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's, it's a complicated answer, a lot of mm -hmm. factors. Um, I would say generally mm -hmm. FGGs are only done in the bottom or in edentulous sites where you need to increase tissue uh, thickness. Mm -hmm. And the CTGs are more for cosmetic areas or for the root kind coverages. of, um, yeah. you know, generic root coverage procedures. Gotcha. Thanks for clarifying that. Excellent. And also, you guys, uh, while watching, if you have any questions, uh, don't be afraid to uh, leave some comments and reply. I'm here to moderate, okay? I'm here to moderate. So a lot of you guys are joining from far away. I want to make this an interactive, a fun uh, uh, mini, uh, you know, uh, overview as well, okay? Second one, tell us this about the second case here. It's also another FGG. Uh, you know, we got to watch out what we say, though. Free gingival graft. Sometimes my patients say, is it free? <laughs> Are you going to do it for free? Right? <laughs> you know, I say, no, damn, you damn, no, no way, man. Like, You're going to pay for this one, right? <laughs> so, yes, uh, for sure. <laughs> um, oh, I know, this, I've had patients ask me that, too. Absolutely. Now, this is very common. This I get all the yes. time, right? It's like a bread yes. butter of an FGG. Tell us about it. So, yeah, as Dr. Kwan's saying, I mean, especially as an implantologist, I can imagine he probably sees this on a daily basis. 
Um, this is the typical patient had these teeth missing for you know many years, if not decades. And it's kind of hard to tell by the color, but where kind of that where you kind of see a horizontal line is where the mucogingival junction, as we would call it, would be. Mm. So anything kind of below that line would be just mucosa. Mm. Um, it maybe just looks that color because it's maybe being stretched and blanched mm. a little bit. Um, but the idea here is, so you can go ahead and place implants. In this case, the bone width was adequate and the height. Um, you can go ahead and place implants um, and then go back and potentially do a gingival augmentation. But I find in these cases, if I know I'm going to need it, I like to do it before. There's two reasons for that. The first one is soft tissue heals much faster than an implant in bone, like the integration time. So in terms of treatment planning, you can do the soft tissue and six weeks later do your implants. Mm. So in terms of timing, I think it saves the patient some time. Mm. Um, the second thing is, let's say you do put the implants in, you have healing abutments on during the healing phase. Mm. I find it's a little bit harder to get um, a nice free gingival graft around healing abutments mm. versus an edentulous site just from a blood, a blood supply standpoint, mm. right? So here you have uh, a blood supply of a whole ridge mm. versus when you have two pieces of titanium there or metal. Um, that's going to cut into your blood supply mm. and ensure the graft uh, mm. succeeds. Mm. So what you'll see here is I've just done a free gingival graft on the edentulous ridge. And if you go through the slides, that's the preparation of a partial thickness. You can mm. kind of see the periosteum still over the, the ridge there. Gotcha. Um, next slide. So for these, what's a little bit different is for the posterior, it's pretty important to tack down um, that flap, mm. uh, so to prevent it from rising back up during healing. So you'll see some chromic gut sutures mm. into the vestibule there to tack that part of the flap down so you don't uh, allow it to come back up. Uh, the beginner, next slide should show just... I find that for beginner dentists, this is a hard part. That This is where I is. had a hard time. Uh, it, and it really frustrated the heck out of me until I learned mm -hmm. from you uh, some of the, the technique that's involved and type of a suture and things things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot, lot of the doctors, um, when they're trying to learn this on their own, I find that they're going to have a hard time. Um, so this is something that you'll probably go through on the pig jaw exercise, correct? Yes, absolutely. I think um, anytime you work in the posterior for soft tissue, it's a little bit more challenging. Just, just even from the standpoint of being able to maneuver your instruments, whether it's your scalpel or your, um, you know, or scissors or, you know, your suturing instruments. So uh, we'll definitely go over this. This is really important. Some people do this for all their free gingival grafts. I just find in the anterior, lower anterior, especially it's not necessary. So it's a step you can avoid. Mm, got it. Wow. So that's just a picture of the graft. Um, again, we'll discuss about how and, and where to take this graft from. Um, this, I would say, is too long. Uh, it looks about, what, 16, 16 millimeters at the top and maybe 18, 20 at the bottom. Impressive. Um, but you, you need to be careful. You need to know your anatomy, obviously, um, to get a nice, nice piece of tissue. Uh, the tissue is sutured. Now, you don't have teeth to sling the sutures around. So uh, you see some simple interrupted sutures kind of around the border of the graft to kind of tack the graft down. But I've also done a kind of a compression suture, um, two of them, just like the last case, kind of across the, the middle portion of the graft. And this, again, is uh, the proline suture, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. So this is at two weeks. Um, actually, I think this is at one week. Mm. And you can see what happens is pretty normal. So if you ever see this uh, for healing of your tissue graft, it's completely normal to see that. That's, that's basically the epithelial uh, layer sloughing off from your graft, mm. right? That epithelial layer is never meant to survive. It's It just lacks that blood supply to reach that surface. So it's generally going to look like this uh, your first week. So don't freak out. As, as long as your graft is stable, it's, mm -hmm. it's going to survive well. Yeah, because sometimes patients will call and say, you know what, this ICO mm -hmm. white stuff coming, is it infected? 
right? And then mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's important to uh, be able to tell the patient that no, it's normal, right? And a lot of these times, my yeah. patients will send me a selfie with their phone, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's what we see. Yeah. So that's after suture removal. You take out the proline sutures, but you can leave the chromic gut as that you see that I've done. Um, you can leave those in the vestibule. They will dissolve uh, probably within the next week. And then these are just some pictures. So this is after, I think, three months of healing. You can see the new mucogingival junction is migrated down to kind of where it's supposed to be, mm-hmm. right, relative to the, the two neighboring teeth. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And now your ridge is ready to, to have your implants placed. Mm-hmm. Another thing that a lot of uh, uh, us uh, don't uh, appreciate is a secondary a function of free gingival grafting is deepening of the vestibule. Um, yes. You know, I think that's a lot of it, you know, o- uh, you know, overlooked aspect of it. Because sometimes uh, I would use FGG a means to increase the vestibular depth. Because when you mm-hmm. have a patient who's had a lot of vertical bone losses and on the buckle, there's hardly any vestibule, it doesn't matter how good the implant position and everything is, you know, the food mm-hmm. will constantly trap there, you know, constantly trap there. And ha- you know, being able to increase the depth of the vestibule, even a few millimeters, that really, really helps with their, you know, daily oral hygiene, I find. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think another indication for soft tissue grafting in general is to improve the ability to do oral hygiene. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, these we can go through quicker just because it's not really pertinent to the soft tissue course, but mm-hmm. I just wanted you to see that after you've done this graft, mm-hmm. you can do the implants very predictably mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and surgery easier, right? And it will also make suturing much easier because you're suturing keratinized tissue together, which mm-hmm. holds much better mm-hmm. than, um, than if you were suturing mucosa to mm-hmm. keratinized tissue on the lingual. Mm-hmm. So here you can see I've done just a one-stage surgery. I did add a little bit of bone for the uh, mm-hmm. premolar, mm-hmm. Um, but here we have healing abutments and, you know, pretty straightforward implant surgery from that standpoint. Beautiful. And this is now, I think it's all ready to, to mm-hmm. the referring dentist for restoration. Wonderful, wonderful. I mean, what also I find more and more is for me is like after we do a lot of like a big time, like a GBR, right? Like a lot of reach augmentation mm-hmm. or vertical reach augmentation where we need to do a peristal release and get that whole thing migrated over to the other side and you do a eversion suture to get attention free yeah. suturing. And then five, six months later that you want to put an implant, what you realize is two things. The cranial gingiva that used to be on the buckle is on the top now. So you, ha- you hardly mm-hmm. have any KG, and you also compromise the vestibular depth. So in those situations, like FGG is almost, you know, inevitable. You have to do it, right? Mm-hmm. So that's another area that I find that if the FGG comes in super, super handy. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. Okay. Ooh, CTG now. CTG. Uh, the funny thing is I got into CTG before I got into an FGG. <laughs> um, the course that I uh, learned the CTG procedure was um, uh, by a gentleman named uh, 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 Pat Allen. Pat Allen, uh, you know, about mm-hmm. 20 years ago, uh, you know, he was uh, running a lot of course with the BioHorizon and utilizing Alloderm as a source of uh, uh, graft material. Uh, so, you know, interesting thing is my my initial you know entry into uh, soft tissue grafting world was one of the hardest thing to do, which is doing CTG using an alloderm. Uh, come to realize yes. that you know, alloderm is not forgiving. It's not forgiving unless no. your technique is pinpoint. You're gonna end up with an infection, and uh, you know, technique has to be so good. So I kind mm-hmm. of uh, I got into soft tissue grafting in a wrong foot. You know, <laughs> I wish I got into a more with an FGG to understand the biology, the blood supply, how the tissue heals, and all that, and then. Also, uh, pair that up with a CTG would have been far better, far better. So uh, take us through the CTG case here. Yeah, so I picked two cases. This first one is a, is a more kind of um, simple one, just from the standpoint that it's a single tooth. Um, the surgery is not simple. It's just less, I guess, less invasive. So I usually tell my students, you know, try to pick, try to be very selective with their first few cases, not only from the standpoint of, you um, 
not only from the standpoint of you being able to do the surgery comfortably, but even more importantly, that uh, simpler cases will have better results generally. And uh, we all know when we go to a course and learn something, it's quite discouraging if you go and try it Monday morning, but it doesn't work. So I think being very selective with your cases is, is super important. Yeah, we've all been there. So here we just have um, a single tooth, one three, uh, with um, I would call it a moderate recession. Um, and you can also see there's a bit of a lack of good quality tissue. So what I, there's so many ways you can do a, a graft here. The, the one I've done, um, if you go to the next picture, is just um, a, a pouch technique. So, or like a little mini tunnel. Mm. And so you can see that there's no incisions on the surface. It's done through the sulcus and uh, it just, re you just release the tissue uh, until it's a little bit loose so that it can be coronally advanced. Obviously, you need uh -huh. a special type of instrument to do this, correct? Yes. Um, the instruments that I generally use are actually the Pat Allen instruments mm. that he uses for tunneling for alloderm. But you can tunnel the same way with those instruments for a CTG. The, mm -hmm. the graph material is not that important. It's mm -hmm. the technique. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah. And yeah. At, at your course, so I, then, I believe uh, we'll, they will be able to... Uh, 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 utilize uh, those instruments during the pig jaw course. Uh, you know, I find that we don't need a lot of instrument, but you need a couple mm -hmm. of a really correct ones, right? Like a circular knife yes. and an orbit knife and things like that. Uh, you don't need yes. a lot. They're not expensive, but you need a few, you know, specific ones to do this type of a procedure, including castro uh, needle, needle drive. A lot of the dentists they bring like this big ass oral surgery needle driver, and they're totally ruining the you know the, the needles and the sutures, right? So uh, that's another right. important thing. So very, in some way, even though it, the concept is not difficult, you know, there's certain technique that that demands uh, a proper instrumentation. Yeah, absolutely. I think. To do any proper dentistry, you need the right armamentarium, but um, it is a little daunting sometimes to go take a course and feel like you have to buy all these new instruments. I would say there's probably only five instruments mm -hmm. that I use routinely for soft tissue that you may not already have in a mm -hmm. surgical kit. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. So it's it's really not that much. Um, okay. okay, so here you see. Um, um, this was harvested through uh, what's called a single incision technique, kind of where the premolars are. And if you look at the picture, there's a, a white suture there kind of knotted on the premolar. Mm -hmm. That is the suture from the palate to as a compression suture to close up the, the donor site. Um, so then this graph, if you look at the next picture, is, um, is basically put into the tunnel. So a little bit can show out like that. So if you were using alloderm, you definitely don't want a little piece poking out like that because it will get infected oh, yeah. and oh, smell. Yeah. Alloderm yep. has to be 100% coverage, correct? Yes. And as Luis just mentioned in a comment, it's got a fishy odor for sure if, yeah. you, if you leave it exposed. But CTG is okay. Yeah. Um, so the, the graft is tucked in, and then you'll see a suture uh, on the next photo to kind of – this is just a single sling suture mm. to try to advance it and – onto the uh, onto the root surface man i tell you a single most uh one of the most powerful and effective suturing technique if people were to ask me one i would call it a sling suture i use it all the time um you know it just mm -hmm. being able the vector force of uh, pulling it uh, coronally and at the same time hugging the root surface uh, nothing mm -hmm. that's better than a sling suture yeah it's one of my my all-time favorite right. jeff yeah. So that's the one week healing, as you can see. At this time, I'm usually just telling the patient to keep the area clean and then we follow it up. And you can see most of the time, soft tissue can be quite forgiving mm -hmm. and you get a pretty good result at the end. Oh, that's a perfect, perfect result. It looks beautiful. Canine is uh, one of the most oftentimes uh, the area that uh, a CTG will be uh, used because of the cosmetic reasons and uh, uh, the, mm -hmm. the root eminence and things like that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very rewarding uh, uh, procedure. Absolutely. We have a question from Ryan, right? Ryan was mm -hmm. saying that, do you end up with a lot of uh, bruising when you're doing this type of a tunneling approach? 
Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Ryan. I think uh, maybe you're asking because you've experienced it before. <laughs> but um, I would say it's definitely very possible. Um, it depends a lot on the patient, mm -hmm. who the their likelihood to bruise, like their complexion. Um, it does depend also on your instruments. So depending on your, if you're making sharp dissection versus dull dissection, mm -hmm. um, I would say generally, yes. Um, if you're very worried about it, you can prescribe uh, a steroid after. I don't routinely do that for soft tissue, mm -hmm. but I do make sure that the patients are taking for even if they have no pain. And uh, I tell them to ice as much as they can for two days after the procedure. Because the issue with bruising and swelling is that people don't, they don't ice until they see it. Yeah. And by the time they see it on day three, it's too yeah. late. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. So, and I, I find that it happens with patients who are a little bit older and on females uh, with the mm -hmm. loose tissue who tend to bruise easily no matter what. Like my wife. I'm not saying that she's old, but she bruises easily. And, you know, uh, those patients, I just say, you know what? You will swell. You will bruise. You're going to look like, you know, Alvin, Simon, Theodore, one of the chipmunks, right? Okay. So, you know, I just tell them right off the head, right off. You better do the ice because it's going to swell. Yes. It's going to bruise. So if you tell them that way, they're going to do it. And then when they come back yeah. two weeks later, I say, oh, bruising was not as bad as you, you, know, you told me, Dr. Kwan. So, you know, it, which, which is good rather than trying to fix it like you say after bruising happened no yeah. ice in the world is going to help right so um yeah i just tell them yeah. the that you know one of the chipmunks one of the chipmunks story okay yeah the case four this is your last case okay dfgg 22-25 yes. tell us this one a little bit okay so this one is um kind of a, a larger case obviously we're involving more teeth um i titled it 22 to 25 but really i actually included the 21 as well as you'll see mm. um the de in before fgg just stands for de epithelialized oh. so it's just a different way of harvesting a ctg mm. at the end of the day what you're what you're getting from the palate is still a ctg mm. i just find this technique works better need a longer piece of graft so for this obviously it's much longer um so, so you can yeah. safely harvest using this technique uh probably from the central to the six mm, so it's just a long the seven depending it. yeah exactly oh, wow. so in this case it wasn't it wasn't that long it was maybe from the lateral to the six mm -hmm. Um, but we got enough tissue to cover from the one to the four here and mm. five was had enough tissue on it to begin with. Mm. Um, this case is also one, if you just go back to the last picture, mm -hmm. uh, if you just look at in terms of predictability, you're not going to, you're not going to promise the patient here. You're going to get a hundred percent coverage, mm. right? First of all, there's a big gap between the two and the three. Whenever there's a gap, there's generally some bone loss. Right. And so you're not going to be able to cover, let's say, the distal portion of the two and the mesial portion of the three very predictably. There's mm -hmm. just no tissue there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but and then, she, you know, this patient also has quite a freedom on the mm -hmm. four. Mm -hmm. So that's another part. When you're doing the release, you need to make sure those fibers are completely released. Otherwise, uh, will kind of retract when you when you uh, during the healing process. For sure. For sure. Uh, so the next picture you can see just the graft sutured. It's still sutured the same way. It's inserted into a tunnel that I made from the oh. one to the four. And here you just see individual sling sutures. Gotcha. So same concept as before. So it's a one uh, long strip of uh, connective tissue grafting harvest from the palate, right? Yeah. Um, so what do you mean by the de-epithelialized? Is it where you take the chunk and then you you take the epithelial layer outside the mouth? Or do you de-epithelialize it in the mouth and then you take the, take the chunk uh, afterwards? I know there's a different ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely, so both those ways work. Um, they, they, you end up with the same result. I personally like to yeah, in the mouth with, uh, with a burr, like a round diamond burr. Mm -hmm. um, just after you've outlined your graft, mm -hmm. uh, you can just go over that area with the burr very gently. Just mm -hmm. remove the, the epithelial layer is very, very thin. It's less than half a millimeter. So you don't want to remove too much. Mm -hmm. 
actually the best quality connective tissue is right below the epithelium. Gotcha. It's not deeper down. Gotcha. So very thin layer you remove, and then you can harvest it like an FGG and mm. uh, treat the palate like an FGG as well. Got it. Got it. Wonderful. And then you take that and then you, you tunnel it the whole thing through underneath all that tunnel, right? Yes. Yes. You want to tuck it in uh, completely under and make sure that it's flat. Mm. Um, it's not getting twisted on itself. Mm. And sometimes you can do this with a suture to thread through. Or sometimes if you can just place it with instruments, you can kind of tuck it in with a probe or... or yeah. I know you demonstrated this uh, at your hands-on uh, course a couple of years ago, so I thought it was pretty cool <laughs> yeah. trick there. Yeah, I remember that one. All right, look at that, eh? Look at that. So this is two weeks. Um, you know, the I was mentioning earlier how f tissue friendly the, the proline suture is. It's so friendly that the tissue actually grows over it sometimes. Yeah. Uh, well, it's you, good to see this. Yeah, yeah, but what do you do? Just yeah. leave it a little longer, I guess, yeah. right? You do want the tails to be relatively long compared to some other sutures um, because the, um, the suture itself is quite thin and quite stiff. So if you leave it very short, it has the potential to Pokey. kind of um, abrade, yeah, the, abrade the kind of the inside of the lip. So a little longer is better because it'll be a little looser. Yeah. And, you know, at suture removal it might be a little bit tight to remove these because they've kind of ingrown into the tissue. But that's always a good sign when you see this. Yeah. I always tell my patients, um, you know, they will eventually find its way out. Eventually. All suture will yeah. find its way out eventually. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, uh, that, that happens quite often with these, uh, these incredibly uh, uh, well-healing suture for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, this is impressive. Look at the result, right? Yeah, so this is after, I think, um, three or four weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and you can still see that the tissue is still maturing. And I think over time, this will look better and better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think I could have done a little better with the Freenum on the four. That still kind of has a bit of potential for future relapse. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll have to see. Would you consider like a phrenectomy in the future for cases like this, if you're in doubt? Yeah, I, I would say that's that. Just, just, you don't even have to do a full, full mm -hmm. phrenectomy. You just want to release the point where it's attaching uh, close to the tooth. Mm -hmm. Probably and, right about and, right here. Yeah. And uh, uh, the relief there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's, th these are not easy. I mean, I would consider these probably a moderate, you know, at least a moderate level. Uh, for mm -hmm. beginner doctors, I think uh, you know, you know, what I did was I tackled the singles first. Okay, a lot of single CTGs, mm -hmm. and then uh, once you get really comfortable with the tunneling, then you're basically doing the same thing over multiple teeth, right? And then I find that the hardest part when I was doing multiple teeth like this with two things was harvesting the palate, because you know, a lot of us, when you first start doing a CT harvesting, we get what we call the, a, a, a chicken harvesting, right? Like, you know, you know <laughs> like a chicken harvesting. You want this much, but you get like this much, right? Yeah. So, you know, and also like when you're harvesting, accidents happen. Like your CDA will suction that thing in, right? <laughs> so you got to go to the other side. How do you tell the patient? You know, I tell my CDA, you tell the patient. You know, you tell the patient, right? So, you know, being able to harvest <laughs> properly, right? I think that's yeah. something that, that you teach really, really well at your course. And second is like tunneling, right? And if you can introducing mm -hmm. that, that harvested connective tissue to properly get it into that tunnel. Okay, because, uh, you know, mm -hmm. if you don't have a same level of the uh, uh, tunneling plane, it gets stuck, right? And that yes. will really frustrate, frustrate the heck out of you, right? So, yes. uh, yeah, and those, again, those are the things that, um, you know, with a good fundamental technique and, uh, uh, you know, principle of it, uh, you know, the doctors will uh, learn very well and benefit from, you know, it's just great result, mm -hmm. great result. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is a little bit later as well, this slide. Yes, this is probably a few months. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's this term yeah. called, Jeff, isn't it creeping attachment? You know, I know among the paradigms, yes. this is what they got, you guys uh, uh, recognize. And at the, at, you, know, er, you know, in the past, you know, like 20 years ago, we didn't really know why, but when we start to follow it up, we start to see that it's looking better and better and better, and and, and some of mm -hmm. the some of the theories that you get improved in blood supply, uh, and, and that contributes to um, uh, you know creeping, 
better coverage over time, right? You know, mm -hmm. this is something that we often see predictably, yeah? Yeah, I, I do think, so for those, it's just a study, it was done in the 80s that showed that after healing of uh specifically it was it was for free gingival grafts um they would see that the gum level like the the chronal advancement of the gums would actually get better and better so more and more root coverage mm. um i do find it much much more with free gingival grafts mm. than with connective tissue grafts mm. um and it it is something that actually does improve with lots of time so my career being, you know, as short as it is, I don't have great kind of track record of seeing that yet. Mm. But I did buy a practice like a 30 year old periodontal practice. And um, the previous periodontist did many free gingival grafts. Mm. And I joke with the patients that when I see them in hygiene, I tell them that I can see his signature in them because mm. it's just so typical what these look like after decades. Oh, wow. Right. So if if anything, I mean, they're all on the bottom. Um, but you know, if anything, you, you can see very clearly that these do really well with time. And actually some of the free gingival grafts end up looking like there's a tori under it. Yeah. That's yeah. how kind of, uh, how well it heals. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's why I tell my uh, prosthetic team, right. When they refer me to do a free gingival graft team, especially my full arches and I, I do it. And mm -hmm. then two weeks later they say, Hey, Dr. Qu it doesn't look that great. I tell them it's going to look better in 20 years. Just wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to look great in 20 years. Now we have a really good question from Louise here. Do yes. you do with implant? My answer is absolutely. Cause that's all I do in my practice. All my FGG, <laughs> it goes around implants, but you know, enlighten us a little bit, a little bit, Jeff, cause we do a lot more yeah. soft tissue gra uh, grafting around uh, implant than we ever did in the past. Right. Yeah. So like what kind of what we talked about earlier on in the, in the show is that, you know, soft tissue thickness and quality is super important now around implants. Um, more and more studies, more and more theories are coming out to, to discuss those two or to discuss that importance. Um, I would say to answer your question quickly, um, anytime there's an aesthetic implant, uh, the graft of choice is usually a CTG to thicken the tissue from within. So you can do that at the time of extraction, at the time of implant placement, whether it's all done immediately all at once, it, you know, that's quite possible. Um, but in peritonized tissue, um, like the case I showed earlier, you either do it before you place the implants or you can do it after around, you know, the healing abutments, preferably before the crowns go on. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. excellent. We also have another question. And now this was a typical question, uh, one from Ryan. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, you know, well, with the non-carrier cervical lesion, do you recommend to do restoration before the surgery to replace the area of missing enamel or to com uh, complete these after? Yeah, so that is a very common question. Great question, Ryan. I would say the way I explain this to patients is, so you have some, generally those patients will have recession and maybe some abrasion as well. So they have lost tooth structure as well as gum structure. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, we want to replace pink that you've lost with pink tissue. And we want to replace white tooth structure you've lost with white filling. And generally what I do with the restorative dentist is I like to do the gums first mm -hmm. because let's say I can only get 90% root coverage. Mm -hmm. You know, it's much, much easier for the restorative dentist to cover that extra millimeter. Mm -hmm or half a millimeter with mm. the class five composite. So as long as the, the lesion is not um, carious, like as you mentioned, the non-carious cervical lesions, mm -hmm. then it's totally fine to do the grafting before. And I think that generally gives us more predictability. Mm. Excellent, excellent. Cool. All right, well, that takes us to the, the showing of the last case. Uh, but before we end our day, I'm just going to put you how do I put you in a solo? There you go, right? So, uh, Jeff, you know, before you go away, right? Uh, I know some of these members are already um, uh, uh, signed up for your course, like Lisa and Scott, and some of them are really looking forward to, especially a lot of the, the doctors that, uh, that, uh, uh, that have joined. 
and just recently graduated, uh, gra recently have graduated our CIR program is, you know, it's obviously it's the next step to, um, you know, improve your, their armamentarium and knowing how to do soft tissue grafting is going to be really incredible. Now, what, like your course coming up in June, what is this mm -hmm. course for? Who are they for? Who is this course for? Is this for a beginner doctors or is it for advanced doctor? Like you know, I know you put a lot of time and effort in designing this uh, uh, upcoming course. So uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, no, I I think that's a great question. Um, this course I would say is mainly for beginners. Let's say beginner to the point where you've never done a tissue graft. Mm -hmm. um, this would be a good course because I will teach you enough to make sure you're comfortable to do one. Mm -hmm. And I can say that because I've done this course previously in Toronto where we did have a third day where um, obviously this was before COVID times, mm -hmm. but we were able to have me um, or have the, the participants, the students book a patient of their own mm -hmm. in a clinic. And I was you know, able to supervise, I think six of the surgeries at one time. Mm -hmm. So imagine they just took the course, they took two days to learn this. And then on the third day, like right after, there's no break, uh, they were doing the surgery and I was just there to observe and to give pointers. And they never had so, done a soft tissue surgery before. Exactly. So, you know, out of the six of them, um, they all did really well. And I think that was a really good feedback for me as an instructor to kind of mm -hmm. see uh, you know, if there was anything lacking, you know, if they had questions that all had the same question kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So this course is definitely for good for beginners. I would say maybe intermediate, maybe if you've taken a course like this before, mm -hmm. you've tried it. And for some reason, whatever reason it is, it's not working as well as you want it to work. Mm -hmm. um, that would that would be good because maybe we can clarify a few things or just mm -hmm. make a couple of tweaks for you. Um, I don't think anyone who is quite advanced in soft tissue grafting is going to benefit too much. They could probably teach me something <laughs> at this course. I, I think what I really find your course, soft tissue course, different than uh, some of the others around. I'm not saying that others are not as good as yours is. I really think that the, the beginner doctors, your soft tissue course is almost a must because you focus so much in fundamentals. and. Folks, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, fundamental does not mean beginner. Fundamental wins the game. And Jeff focuses heavily on the biology, the healing, and fundamental principle of soft tissue healing. And, and from there, you have a really strong foundation to build your own technique upon later on. Okay, So mm -hmm. that's what I find that your course is so good you know, um, it stands out for me. And I'm, I'm a firm believer in teaching the good fundamentals. And we get often mm -hmm. get, you know, um, uh, uh, impressed by trickeries, you know, like, you know, fancy stuff. And, you know, when I post something on the Facebook, something fancy and sexy, I get a lot of posts and likes. But deep down, I know that's not really what's, what makes me a good surgeon, right? It's always <laughs> the fundamentals, right? Sometimes less is more, right? And I think, you know, yeah. your, your philosophy and mine, you know, it, it matches really, really well. Anyways, Jeff, yeah. thank you so much for for your uh, time. I know it's a well past your bedtime. And oh, <laughs> before you go, um, yes, yes, it is, some people are asking, it is a two-day uh, heavy didactic and heavy hands-on. Pig jaw is Jeff's yes. uh, signature. Uh, he does pick job very, very well, and uh, you'll be also good to uh, uh, hang around with with Jeff as well. I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm you know I haven't seen uh, a Jeff for a long time. I'm really, really looking forward to it in June. So uh, yeah, you know, come and uh, come to Bice Institute. Too. We will be at a new facility. Our fourteen thousand square foot facility really? will be open. It will be open, man. It's, you know, you'll oh, be, I'm the, so you'll be the first hands-on course at our own facility. It, you're gonna be so stoked, okay? So it's an amazing facility. Um, you know, it's uh, long overdue. It's supposed to be uh, open end of last year, but shit happened last year, <laughs> right? Okay, so it's going. We're gonna be uh, opening in in May. We'll have it all polished up for you when you come. And it's going, we're going to have a great fun time. So, Jeff. That is you, so exciting. You take care, my friend. Stay healthy. And uh, we're going to see Thank you Thank you. Okay? Take care. Thank you. Good All night, right. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Fantastic. Okay. All right, guys. So, 
that's it, man. That that's what comes down to. All right. I uh, hope you guys uh, enjoyed uh, this evening. Okay. Uh, it was fantastic for Jeff to join us. Uh, uh, that's why we changed it from 10 o'clock to 7 p.m. Right, so that more of you guys can uh, uh, join. Uh, it was a great overview. I think as a general dentist who does implant for a living, and I cannot think of not doing soft tissue grafting. Uh, it's a big part, big part of my practice. Uh, very, very typical of what I do, um, and it's something that uh, uh, you know, I've learned a lot. Uh, you know, even though Jeff, I have a lot more experience than Jeff. Probably I've done more soft tissue grafting than Jeff has. Uh, but his fundamental is very, very strong, okay? Even as somebody who's intermediate and who's advanced level, it'll be good to revisit some of the fundamentals, right? So CTG and FGG, the course is strict, you know, very focused for, for CTG and FGG, okay? It's a two-day course, so yeah, uh, it's almost getting full uh, because of the uh, unknown social distancing uh, protocol we are limiting the registration so we have about 70 percent filled up and i think uh angela's also uh, have a sp uh, uh early bird special going on um for the limited uh numbers uh you know we're in including a seven inch uh castro nevo needle driver for those early bird registrants okay so if you want your spot if you want to get it get yourself a brand new castro needle driver okay uh, sign up with angela uh, so yeah, that's going to be fantastic. Okay, fantastic. So that uh, takes us to the end. Um, if you have uh, any question, okay, uh, please leave a comment uh, and uh, remarks, okay, to Jeff or myself. Uh, he will continue to answer some of the the questions. And this uh, live recorded video will stay on for 24 hours, okay, before it comes down. So uh, if you have a friend who hasn't watched that, tag them below so that they also can. Uh, uh, you know, learn with from the overview. Okay. Hope you guys have a wonderful evening. Happy uh, weekends. And uh, once again, thanks for joining Late Night Coffee Show Uncensored and Live. And take care, guys. Okay. Bye bye. All right. Where do we go? Where do we go? Where's my next thing? Okay. Here we go.